ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about Wonder Woman. As you can see, it's flying through the different times and periods. We're in 1953, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay. We're going through time here really fast. But you can always look at this at a slower pace if you want by going to DC Entertainment. 75 years, 75 Wonder Woman. It's really awesome. All right. Check it out. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about it in a minute or so. So enjoy this little very quick run through of the appearance of Wonder Woman through time. And then I will go into some more detail about it in some of the videos that will come. All right. So basically, if we are to scroll through time with Wonder Woman, we're going to learn so much about the adjustments that were made to her through time and it reflects really the period of time that uh, she existed in and what the emphasis in those given periods of time were on alright so very quickly if we can this is the golden age Wonder Woman alright and this is the silver age Wonder Woman and then we have the Bronze Age Wonder Woman here. We have the New 52, and then we have the Rebirth Wonder Woman here. Okay? So, if we're looking at the 1940s, Wonder Woman started off what some people think is a skirt, but it's not really a skirt. It was actually a, uh, a track and field dress. It's actually, it's a pants, believe it or not. Um, it has a specific name. We'll get into that. Okay? But as you can see, in the 1940s, 1950s, we, we juggled between this. Actually, it started off with this dress here, and then it merged into this. Everything started getting shorter and shorter as time went along, okay? 1960s was a little bit of a different time. It was a different time. 1970s, they reverted back to more or less this style, but they, the, the emblem on the chest was no longer just a plain eagle. In the 80s, there was some tweaking of that. Right, this shortened up this kind of opened up a bit in the 90s uh, we had more of this style but still it more or less the basic style from the 1970s was maintained all the way up to 2010 okay so basically the basic style maintained all the way up for 40 years it was maintained all right but then things started to change around 2000 and 12. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Get into more details. So we're going to start off with the Golden Age Wonder Woman. And this was designed by H.G. Peter, William Marston, also known as Charles Marston. He was responsible for saying what he exactly wanted. And M.C. Gaines. Now this character actually was launched somewhere around the same time in fact it was in the same year as Captain America so the themes of both Wonder Woman and Captain America are very similar so we have the stars and stripes for instance here we've got the eagle that's on the chest Captain America had a shield so there was an eagle on the shield as well and basically this is the colors of the United States of America if you haven't realized okay now, in 1942, which was just one year later, what was appearing here to be a skirt was really a pants. It was a wide leg shorts worn by female athletes. They were called culottes. Okay? I hope I'm pronouncing that word correctly. And they gradually transformed into skin-tight shorts. But here's the interesting thing I told you guys about in a video before. This may sound funny by today's standards, but the comic book ended up on a major banned book list due to her being not sufficiently dressed. See, women at the 1940s wore clothing all the way down to their legs, and now one woman was wearing these tights. Now, athletes would wear these tights, but also this was like their underwear. This is like underwear for these women, okay? <laughs> so, I just, and that's why I told you back then, I said it in a video long before, back then, this would be considered soft porn, <laughs> strange as it sounds. Well, what soft porn is to us today, where people don't really watch it, and you want to be looking at soft porn in, in a movie or cinema or in public, they need this indecent exposure, right? Well, that's what this comic was like. Strange as it sounds, it's the truth. Okay, 
Now, after that, for seven years, this design pretty much stuck around, okay? And then in 1949, Peter's initial costume sketch had Wonder Woman in Greek-inspired sandals. So, you see, this is kind of like Greek wear here. Not completely, but it is kind of like it, right? This is what the ancient Greeks actually wore. But Marston preferred boots, so Wonder Woman had boots with some heels in them, which was kind of very impractical. Two years after Marston's death, so he died, which I guess in 1947, the sandals suddenly appeared in the comics. Sans heels with no heels, that is, with separate leg straps, her shorts gradually decreasing in length. As you can see, the shorts are shorter than these. And you can also notice, let me just try and zoom in here, that there are no heels, which makes sense. If you're a warrior, you need to move quickly. You can't be in heels for that. That's, that's just terrible. Now, from that point in time, we move to 1959, which was known as the Silver Age. And in the Silver Age, of course, the shorts are getting shorter, but now they add to these Greek clothing heels. And this is because Peter died in 1958. So after a 16-year run on the book, Ross Andrew became the new lead artist, remaining so for nine years. He swapped the sandals for pumps, which was just totally impractical. And, of course, obviously, they're talking, they're trying to accentuate the woman's sexuality. And the previously detailed eagle perch on her belt was now simplified. In 1969, which is 10 years later, he took away the Greek uh, straps and he put in boots. So he went back to what uh, Marston was doing. Of course, he did not have the white stripe running down the center, the American theme running through it. Okay, and the eagle, of course, is an American theme as well. Anyway, three years later, Wonder Woman gave up her superpowers and costume in favor of martial arts combat and mud inspired civilian clothing. And we can see that, let me just scroll back into time here. This is her here in the 1960s. Okay? So they totally abandoned the outfit. Alright, cool. In 1972, however, they returned to the outfit. Gloria Steinem, a founder of feminist magazine Miss, campaigned to get her childhood hero's power and costume restored. Of course, you notice the costume's getting shorter and shorter, right? The costume retained with minor tweaks. She was given a golden belt, blue bracelets, blue bracelets, she had black bracelets before, blue bracelets, chunky heels, so there was a compromise, I guess, wavy here, you see she has wavy here this time, and high cut briefs, so they, <laughs> they basically emas they effeminated her or, or feminated her or something, but they, they really... You know, they said, oh, you want to get a barrel back? Fine, we're going to just cut down the briefs a bit. All right, we're going to put on, we're going to make sure to keep the heels. We'll make her have more here. She must look pretty. Or whatever, appealing, whatever. This was the look anyway that she had in her design in Super Friends. Okay. From there, uh, there was a departure from that style again in 1974. The Wonder Woman made for TV movie presented a Wonder Woman who lacked power similar to the mod era comics in 1969 and onwards, but contained a few differences. The biggest difference, aside from Kathy Lee Crosby being blonde, was the costume designed by Bill Thomas, a, depart a dramatic departure from what had come before, which feminists should have dug, but actually, sadly, the TV series, this didn't even last a year, the TV movie was not a hit at ABC as they had hoped, and went in a new direction closer to the 1940s comics, so much closer in fact, they even took place during the 1940s, Linda Carter wore a Dunfeld design, featured his interpretation of the original Perch Eagle, the original Perch Eagle, and I should say I have a red, uh, that original design here, there's the original design there, Perch Eagle, okay, and this is this is his design of that. Have a look again. So this is actually an eagle you can see here. A little bit of a design here. And then this one. Okay, let me get to it. There you go. It's kind of pretty. 
Linda Carter wore the design. Uh, the stars scattered in a pop art style. So you just have this, all the stars up in here. Now, if you do recall, the original Wonder Woman had a lot of stars as well. But now, these stars here in this version of Wonder Woman were a little bit different, right? She also had silver bracelets for the first time. Now, ABC opted against renewing for a second season, and the series moved to CBS. The character also moved into the present. So from 1940s, she moved into the present. There were less stars on her. The eagle was stripped a bit. You can see it's stripped a bit. And um, he also cut her brief shorter. So <laughs> she just continuously gets uh, cut shorter and shorter and shorter. You notice what they're doing to her, right? Now, I don't know if women picked it up. I mean, this it's one thing to be cool that is okay, sexuality you're selling and whatever. But then it's kind of <laughs> not so cool when they keep on she got heels, which is very impractical for a superhero. I'm cool with the bracelets, but it was like they were trying to streamline her and just cut everything down. Her, the, the 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 bra area went down. The, the, the this is getting cut higher and higher. You know what I'm saying? Now, I know they're trying to appeal to the man, but come on now. When, that's why Linda Carter was just seen as a sex icon more than... People don't remember her really for her anything else. Anyway. The white striped boobs not only carried over into the present day, but also into the comics. So this was the Wonder Woman that they had, which was kind of like a pin-up model. I'm not going to be lying to you. This is like a pin-up model. And it gets worse. It gets worse, folks. In 1982, which is the Bronze Age Part 2, remember the Bronze Age started with Linda Carter, right? If you guys didn't know, the Bronze Age started with uh, Linda Carter, 1972. Okay, it was a little bit before Linda Carter, it was with Super Friends, okay? So this is basically a bikini, a one-piece bikini, right? One-piece bikini. Let's keep it moving. <laughs> it gets worse. <clears throat> Promoted by DC Comics president Jeanette Kahn, commissioned a new Wonder Woman chest emblem by graphic designer Milton Glaser. So now it just had the Wonder Woman logo. Okay. Who also designed the DC Comics logo that was in use from 1977 to 2005. Variations on the stacked WW logo have been central to every costume since. In 1987, which is post-crisis, so we're out of the Bronze Age. The DC Universe was rebooted after Crisis on Infinite Earths. George Perez added a second point to Wonder Woman's belt and tiara. A point here, below. And a point below with the tiara. Her blue bracelets became silver bracelets once again. And most notably, the heels on the boots disappeared, which was making so much sense now. And never returned in the comics, which is really awesome. However, in 1994, ah boy, in the 1990s, Wonder Woman became one of the lowest selling books. As a result, Mike Diotto, or Diotado Jr. was given plenty of creative freedom and he gradually cut her top lower and her briefs higher. So this is basically a bikini model. He went so far as to give her a thong, not noting every time the bikini was smaller, the sales got higher. I mean, you just, totally disrespecting her all right also wonder woman in the 1980s had this poofy 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 curly 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 here now it kind of follows greek mythos but still so far man this is where the feminist would have had an absolutely correct point in 1994 she was basically a pinup model she was made basically a, a sexual item as far as i'm concerned it's just ridiculous what they were doing her. in 1995 or ever they gave her a relook this is the 90s clothing that used to be there. Rather than give up being Wonder Woman after being stripped of her tiara, she simply changed her outfit and kept on going. Everybody disliked that costume, myself included, but it was what was asked for at the time, said designer Brian Bolin. I just wanted to draw in the, in the original uniform. In 1995, post-crisis number four, John Byrne went back to the classical look made a few modifications of his own. He increased the size of her bracers, tiara, bikini, and belt. 
enlarging the latter into a full abdominal covering. The belt, that is. The chest emblem became more angular and the bikini was pared down to an easier to draw two stars. But of course, it's still way up in the air and it's called a bikini now. <laughs> After Burns' run, the costume reverted back to a post-crisis look. Right? And you got kind of more of a eagle emblem on the top there. Right. A single solid shape without etched details and controversially made her boots look loose and saggy. Which makes no sense again. Why would you have loose, saggy boots? You need to be agile, right? In 2006, post-Infinite Crisis, in a throwback to the original chest emblem, Terry Dutson transformed the stacked WW into an eagle. He also added a stacked WW belt reminiscent of Boland's design and gave her lower cut briefs which for the first time in the history of Wonder Woman they actually lowered down her briefs this was worn by Donna Troy but given to Diana when she returned to the role in 2010 I'm not gonna lie to you I like this style actually in 2010 designed by Jim Lee with input from writer J. Michael uh, Straczynski the decision to put her in leggings was surprisingly controversial. Even a few feminists disliked the change, among them Gloria and Steinem. Jeans give us the idea that only pants can be powerful. Tell that to Greek warriors and sumo wrestlers. But honestly, I like this design. I really do. And it feels pretty powerful as well. But anyway, the new 52 look in 2011 by Jim Lee, he went back and he had pants at first and then he removed them. And... Um, Basically, they accepted this. So this was the new 52. Now, in 2015, designed by Jeff Finch with input from his wife and writer Meredith Finch, the intent was to represent Diana's succession from princess to a queen, as well as bring her costume more in line with what her Justice League teammates were wearing. It lasted only as long as Boland's before being reverted. But it really was badass. I like this one as well. This reminds me of Feora. Feora L's uniform as well. Yeah kind of like it um then we had superhero girls this line of action figures and so on gave okay, this design it was designed by jen rajanoto and then of course we have the bvs design which is designer michael wilkinson's look he looked at the long history of her costume and reinterpreted it in the style of greek armor the result is similar to Xena Warrior Princess's design because she has similar influences. So that is the Morphous, uh, the general Morphous of Wonder Woman from 1941 to the present time. And as you can see, for a great extent of that period, they were just shortening her, her dress and sort of just exposing her more and more. And I think it was because you had a male base that was, was driving this and um, male people designing her. I mean, the first female designer, I think, was Steinem. So, I think, after that, and and when she was stripped of her powers, the compromise seemed to be, oh, you get back the powers? Okay, but we're going to just kind of disrespect her a bit. So, it was only, I believe it was in uh, 2000 and, it was in 2006 that Terry Dutson actually brought some decency back to her and then Jim Lee did his thing but all along they were just kind of making her more and more into a pinup model with no sense whatsoever behind it so um, now currently she's more of a stole soldier you could see that the difference between her here in 2006 even let's go back in time a little bit so you can see what I'm showing you so I'm gonna try and zoom out of everything they're all one size and I'm literally going to go through time here with them so you can see what I'm talking about see the ridiculousness going on there but you can see she got reclothes here so just watch at this figure here focus on this figure at the end and watch this
okay now this is here from 1941 focus on just this figure you can look at all of these but at, look how this figure changes with time look what they did how they shorten up her clothing that's super friends there in 1972 1977 that's with uh, Linda Carter see how it shortened up a bit top and bottom look how ridiculously short she is here in 1994 look how ridiculously short she is in 1998 now she puts on a little something in 2011 and now she's a soldier and she actually puts on more in 2016 and I'm just showing you you know things started to get back in balance back in the 2000 and, 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 and 2006 they started to pull things back together and she was wearing pants and strangely they rejected the pants from her which is sad because 2010 was really good that costuming 2015 and 2015 costumes were also very good I'm surprised they uh, didn't like that even 1995 costume they didn't like which is kinda interesting 1974 again they didn't take to that and of course we know that in 1969 she wore something looking like this and again they didn't completely take to that or as the woman lobbied for her to get back her powers now to be fair this version here in 1974 again was stripped of powers I don't know why you have to look decent and when you look decent you're stripped of your powers what are they saying the powers come with the with the with the shortened up clothing and the more revealing that's what I didn't like but thankfully we are now in the 2000s and in 2006 uh, they started to again reclothe her and she was keeping her powers strangely women didn't want her to be clothed like this I don't know why but she stayed like this she looked more like an athlete even though she kinda looked like a soldier but more like an athlete and then here in 2015 this is dope but I guess they didn't like the long boots there and then here this is a lot shorter I little children play with this one and this one looks like a warrior it actually looks like a warrior this this absolutely is awesome okay I love it and it's it kinda harkens back to the very beginning it harkens back to the very beginning here this is a little bit more slovenly but it harkens back to this beginning to some degree and so it's really awesome to look at how she evolved through time now there are so many other variable variations to Wonder Woman but first on June 3rd will be Wonder Woman Day and you will have free comic book day for Wonder Woman comics okay so that's gonna be awesome again this is the beginning here and this was actually a very baggy pants this was not a skirt I thought it was a skirt but it's not and she found she was uh, she began in uh, number 8 of all-star comics okay and they introduced Wonder Woman in that comic which is really awesome now we already kind of covered this with Wonder Woman in television but I'm going to just cover it a little bit here so the first person who kind of covered Wonder Woman the person you're looking at here is Linda Harrison who also starred in Planet of the Apes and you see her dressed in that early Wonder Woman costume okay uh, but really the first time it actually ran as a series on TV was with Kathy Lee Crosby in 1974 that is the version of Wonder Woman we saw over here Kathy Lee Crosby and um, that Wonder Woman didn't have superpowers but it didn't last but a year before it had to move on and they moved on to Linda Carter's version of Wonder Woman which is which is uh, right here this is the original Wonder Woman costume I'll show you it right there this is the original Wonder Woman costume. It would change into this costume in 1977. Let me see if I can find that there. So in 1977, that costume would change into this costume. Okay. Now notice how much lower cut it is. So it shows her chest more. And it's cut up higher as well. And this was what aired on CBS. Again, revealing more of Wonder Woman, which I found was not cool. See the original Linda Carter, see how that looked? And uh, silver bracelets, really awesome. But the later version made her more of a pinup model than of. Um, but I guess that was the appeal for that, and so that series lasted quite a while. You see her there in different outfits. 
All right, and she's still, she's still, um, she's still a big item to this day. In several interviews, Linda Carter has said she was somewhat uncomfortable with altering the Wonder Woman costume in the second season, with the show producing certain posters of her simply to increase sex appeal. There you go. In a 1979 interview with U.S. Magazine, she said, I never meant to be a sexual object for anyone but my husband. I never thought a picture of my body would be tacked up in men's bathrooms. So, uh, that's what happened with her, unfortunately. And you can see that they, they went down that line quite a lot. Uh, uh, in cartoons, etc. Right? Um, but... The next attempt at getting Wonder Woman on the television stream was with Adrian Palicki many, many years later in 2011, and that backfired. That pilot did not hit the ground. Now, she had the New 52 costuming, and she also had uh, a variation of the original costume. It wasn't the New 52. It was kind of a Linda Carterish costume, but it just never worked out uh, for her. And that's just what it is. It's just what it is. So, we had a number of successful animated uh, and comic book iterations of Wonder Woman, but on the television, on the small screen, uh, only one person was really successful with that, and that was Linda Carter. And they have not tried to bring a live action, small screen version of Wonder Woman on television after that, okay? Um, Paliki just did not land. And the Wonder Woman character is not that easy to pull off, believe you me. It's like Superman. It's a, it's a tricky subject. Now, there are still many iterations in between the iterations we just spoke about of Wonder Woman. For instance, this one here, where she's a gladiator. This one here, where she's medieval. She's dressed like a medieval knight. So, there are some other versions of Wonder Woman. And, I will show you something else. This is just it blown up a little bit more. Here is some of the versions that are really awesome to talk about. So we have here the 1941 version that we talked about, and that was uh, shortened up a bit. And in 1967, we had the first attempt at just seeing the Wonder Woman on screen. And this was from the Planet of the Apes Lady, right? And then we had the 1968-1969 version, which was depowered Wonder Woman, just dressed in civilian uh, wear. 72 brought about Super Friends Wonder Woman, and 73, you see there. In 73, you have Super Friends Wonder Woman still, and then we had uh, the depowered Wonder Woman again on the television screen. And I'm going to show you that right here. 1974. Okay, that was Kathy Lee Crosby. And then right after Kathleen Crosby, that didn't pull off. And a lot of people thought that maybe Kathleen Crosby would pull it off because we had feminism going on and, and all these things. The irony of the situation was that it was in 1975, Linda Carter actually pulled it off. She went back to the original costuming, more or less, uh, of the 40s and 50s. And she was able to pull it off. Of course... When she went to CBS, they kind of took it to another extreme and, and really the best, I think the best iteration of Wonder Woman by Linda Carter was her early version of her uh, on ABC. In 1978, we had in the comics, this version of Wonder Woman here, 80, all the way up to 82, basically Linda Carter's version of Wonder Woman stood for a very long time with variations of the theme on her chest. So instead of having the eagle, she would have this W. This went all the way up to 1998, all the way up to 2000 actually, was that basic form. There isn't that much of a departure as you already know. But here's the cool part. Wonder Woman actually started crossing barriers of race. So we had black versions of Wonder Woman. Yes, she had the perm and long hair, but we had black versions of Wonder Woman. We had a version that looked like Storm for a minute. We had Russian versions of Wonder Woman in 1997. We had uh, Amazonian people from Brazil, a Brazilian version of Wonder Woman. We had Egyptian version of Wonder Woman here in 1990. Uh, we had a black version of Wonder Woman in 2001, black version of Wonder Woman, a colored version of Wonder Woman in 2001 uh, with Justice League. And then we had uh, sort of uh, 
European long-haired version of Wonder Woman here. Uh, then we had the Warrior. In 2006 and onwards, we started seeing more of the Warrior version of Wonder Woman, even though she <coughs> she was mostly geared up. So here you can see that this is an armored plate sort of gladiator like a well outfit a gladiator iron and steel here and it's really well protected 2007 reverted back to the classical wonder woman for a minute 2008 back to the warrior again uh 2008 in video games she popped up 2009 she had her own movie and here we saw her in action and then in 2009 we had straight out a nubian this means to say an African Wonder Woman, literally with African features. Okay, do remember that in 2009, 2008 to 2009, Barack Obama had become president of the United States. Barack Obama had actually been in an iteration of the DC Comics as Superman. So it wasn't surprising that people started to cross over and really embrace black people fully and their features. So we had a black, what we called Nubian Wonder Woman. And then we had an Asian version of Wonder Woman in 2010. Uh, and in 2011, we had the sort of uh, New 52 uh, uh, sort of hip Wonder Woman. So it was more of a person. It looked like a more a sub, uh, like a, a city version of what would you find somebody in the city wearing. So then we had, again, we, we returned to the warrior. We now had a shield and a sword, 2010, 2011, 2000. In 11, we saw the new 52 Wonder Woman rise up. Then we had the television series in 2011, with, which was a pilot that flopped, unfortunately. And at the end of 2011, we had another movie with Wonder Woman. And again, you can see this is the ancient Greek fighting uh, uniform, right? The, right? Uniform, outfit, whatever you want to call it. But it's armored. It's an armored suit. 2012, we fall in line back with the original Wonder Woman outfit, and then we got in 2012 uh, Justice League War. We also had in 2012 the DC, DC Lego action movie, so it was in Lego form. And then, but all of these were again the classical 1970 Super Friends kind of Wonder Woman. In 2012, we had again the Warrior Soldier. 2013 we had the new 52 Wonder Woman with sort of the motif of the eagle on the chest and this was for Injustice Gods Among Us then we had again we revert back to the warrior outfit and in the warrior outfit again we're looking at the Greeks the Romans the Spartans you know all of these warriors this is how they dressed in 2013 it went contemporary for a minute as you can see here this is just laid back, normal clothing like uh, people. Superman was normal clothing. And it was just contemporary of the time in the world, normal world. Oh, so just realize this is a black Wonder Woman again. And then we had in 2013, more of a Thor-like sort of uh, Odyssey, mythical uh, Greek, again, influence. 2013, also we had again the normal just the normal civilian dressed where so they were jumping in between contemporary times and throwing all the way back into ancient times to how the warriors were so we get this contemporary ancient contemporary ancient and then every now and then they go back to the 1973's version of wonder woman this the, 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 the normal uh, bronze age wonder woman here again, we go way back into ancient times, and we are again a Greek, a Greek gladiator, Greek warrior. And then we have the New 52 in 2015, which is still a warrior with a sword, a shield, armor-plated suit uh, to block off bullets and stuff like that, right? So again, we go into the warrior aspect, 2015, heavily armor-plated suit. Um, just heavy armor. It's like a again throwback all the way back to the Greek times. We go to 2015, same thing. 2015. Then we jump all the way back now into the the war days of World War II, 
and we're kind of looking at the times when women used to work in the factories. So this outfit actually looks more like uh, someone who works in a factory. So it's a throwback to the war times of World War II. And then we jump all the way back into time again, all the way back, but yet still slightly forward into time where you have a slightly contemporary but still at the same time throwback to the Greek warrior in the 2015 version, the last animated version of Wonder Woman. And then the entire of 2016 into this present time, we went straight back into Greek mythology and we went full-blown, full-geared, heavily armored Greek warrior outfit. We went as heavy Greek warrior as we possibly could have gone and so this suit is as accurate to the Greek the Greco-Roman uh, soldiers that used to fight as it could ever possibly be and they've stuck with that all right so what will it be in 2018 or 19 will we jump back into the contemporary period our era will there be a suit like that or will it be something again will we just throw back to the 1973 Bronze Age again and go there I don't know but what I do know is they, they, they go through certain eras. It's either you're going to be a contemporary era, you're going to go to the ancient Greek era, or you're going to be in the 1970s, especially 1973, the Bronze Era. Most of the mixes and, and pulling of information from different eras still tends to abide with any one of those three, mostly, except for this 2015 one here. This is pure Greek. This is ancient again. So sometimes she has a cape. Oh, is that a cape? No, that's her hair. Okay. So <clears throat> basically, the iteration that we will be seeing in the movie uh, is right now across the board in the comics, or at least in the Rebirth comics, and it's also in DC Justice League action. It's that iteration is completely across the board. Now there are other iterations of Wonder Woman that are actually being presented in the comics as well. But for the most part, this is the iteration they're going with. Now, what does this mean? Wonder Woman has not been successful on the small screen, which is television, for an enormous amount of time. We're talking about from somewhere in the 1980s till the present time. So that's, that's more than 30-something years. So, in short, what I'm saying is, if Wonder Woman is to be a success on the small screen, she must be a success on the big screen. So when you evaluate, you know, you're evaluating your information, you're evaluating your data, you have to think, is Wonder Woman going to be successful on the big screen with this particular iteration of her? They've done a lot of research on Wonder Woman. People know that you can't make her too feminist because for some reason, even women and feminists rebel against that. But if you make her functional, then you have grounds for speaking about the feminist values that she speaks about in her movies. Because Wonder Woman is, to a very high degree, someone who pushes for a feminist agenda. That is to say, in the pure sense of the word, when we talk about feminism, we're not necessarily speaking about female superiority. We're not necessarily speaking of female domination. And we're not talking about lesbian and gay rights either. So when you put all of those things aside, we're talking about uh, you know, feminism in its essence, which is simply this. If you are someone in this world, you should be respected. An oppressed person, women and children, if you are oppressed, that is to say, if you, for instance, are doing a job but because you are a woman, you get paid less to do the same work, that is a form of oppression. If you are someone who is exploited on the job because you are a woman or because you are a child, well, children don't work, but... Let's just uh, okay, you're a woman or a child, then that is also an inequality and an undeserved inequality. We feminism does not, I think a lot of people get the wrong perception of feminism. Feminism does not espouse or it does not promote that everyone is born equal and therefore everyone 
should be able to do roles and tasks like everyone else. For instance, it would be idiotic to think that a man should give birth to a child, just as it would be idiotic to think that a woman can do uh, to play the role of a father in a family. It's, it's not possible, right? So we're not talking about equality in terms of roles. We're talking about equality in terms of if I decide I want to do this particular career and I am doing it, I should get respect in the field for the knowledge that I've ac acquired and the work I have done. I shouldn't have to be hazed because I am the first of all my people to do so, whether it is via race or gender or age. So I think this is where I think the fight for equality in feminism makes sense. And I think this is what Wonder Woman is all about. She's not about, uh, <clears throat> she's not all about the gay and lesbian and all of that agenda. No, 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 no. She is about finding an equal playing field or at least starting in an equal playing field if someone decides to do something career-wise. If I want to do football, if I want to play football, I shouldn't have to go through all this hazing and all of these other things and people telling me I shouldn't do it because I'm a woman or I shouldn't do it because I'm a man. If I want to play football, I'm good at playing football, I should be allowed to play football. It's that simple. And I think a lot of times people try to regulate and control what other people in this world do. And we have a lot of masochists out here, or chauvinists, who are feel intimidated by the fact that a woman somewhere could be doing something just as good or better than they are. And this is something that has to end. And I do agree that in the present world climate, this movie, I keep on emphasizing this over and over again, is going to give a voice for women all around the world. Uh, there's a problem with having somebody who is a princess in Hollywood. The princess in Hollywood always has to be saved. And I find that sort of narrative rather insulting to a lot of people. Because if you think about it, if you've ever had a mother or an elderly woman in your family, they do more saving of you than you do of saving them, okay? Reality is that there are a lot of women in many positions in the world who are very competent at what they do and actually are the people who help to bring help to endless people, whether they be male or female. And I think that this movie should have a paradigm shift. It's not Wonder Woman delighting in beating up men because she comes from, she comes from a background and an environment where there are only women and they don't want women on, they don't want men on their island. They don't want men on their island. But Diana goes and she rebels against that and she says, no, we live in the world. We're supposed to protect us of all people. Therefore, we have to learn to live with both men and women and everybody else and we have to find a way to work together so that we can protect one another. So Diana goes against the grain of this unisexism and separators and separating people. So I, I find this very, uh, uh, this movie being something that is a paradigm shift that I think, because Patty Jenkins is directing it, I think Patty Jenkins may be able to navigate the waters sensibly enough and smart enough so that the present political environment we're in, which is pretty caustic right now, if you are someone who thinks and uh, you're someone who uh, looks at resources and materials and comes from facts, apparently that's not a good thing anymore. Apparently you are called an elitist today because you have a little bit of information and you try and research things. But sadly, the people who are pushing agendas today, they are elderly people, they are white people, they have blonde hair, they have blue eyes, and they believe that women should be in these secondary positions and they shouldn't have a voice. And if they open their voice to say anything, they should be punished. So we have the, uh, this lady who was the, uh, the, the, in, the, in the Department of Justice, she was fired for maintaining morals and standards 
and was called a traitor by the President of the United States. Okay? So you look at this and you're saying to yourself, are you serious? Then he goes and he, this guy becomes President of the United States because he digs up a lot of false lies and dirt against the other candidate who was a woman castigating her and speaking very lowly about her and he had this history of also uh, denigrating women from his competitors in his campaign this is the environment we're in where supposedly the world power which is the United States of America they are endorsing a president who does not respect women like that he, uh, he, he insults women to their face he says you're ugly he, he says Anything he thinks about saying just comes out of his mouth and he doesn't care. Okay? So that's the kind of environment we're in. And that's why I'm not a leftist, per se. I do agree in some of the Republican values, especially when it comes to business um, and about successful business kind of driving things. But I don't like the slant that they're going on where they pretty much insult the oppressed in society and say that they are actually living off of the rest of the American public and they are the problem and they need to pick up themselves by their bootstraps and do something about it. I disagree with that. I believe you should push money into businesses. I think you should fuel your economy through business, but you should always look out for the oppressed. You should always look out for the poor and needy because that's why your businesses are there. And guess what? If you can help the poor and needy in your society, the people who you say are a burden on it, well, guess what? If they're not poor and needy anymore, or they will always have poor and needy in our mouths, but if they're not as poor and needy, then they can help drive your business so that you can have customers, loyal customers at that, who will assist your business if some of them, if even some of them come out of their poor and needy situation, then they take less burden off of the, the community. If a person is a junkie, for instance, and somehow he cleans up and he's working, he's less of a burden on society because guess what junkies do? They beg people for money, they steal, or they mess up the place and they, they, they go crazy and then they do all kinds of destructive behaviors. Right? So a junkie becomes less of a burden on your society if that junkie is actually assimilated into the system and is doing something whether it's they're selling they're into the business community themselves or whether they're not employed themselves but they're employed by someone whatever it is it'll help the society if you can get more of these people who are poor and needy out of that level of course it's up to them as well but it's out of that level and assimilate them to a level higher than they are before. And who knows? Some of them come up from being poor and needy and they become leaders in your community. Some of them come out of prison and they become big changes of society. But we, as a society, have to understand that our policies, if we are businessmen, that means we are responsible for the people, not just our clients, but the community and what kind of culture and what kind of community because we have a bigger voice, a bigger say. We, 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 we determine what kind of community we'll have. So I, I, have a, I, I seriously think that Wonder Woman is probably going to change some paradigms, this movie. Like I said, I think this is much more than just being a DCEU movie. It, this is not about the future of the DCEU DC will be fine. It'll, it'll go on without or with whatever happens to Wonder Woman. It'll be fine. That's not the problem. The problem is this movie. I'm not saying it's a political statement. I don't want to get Patty Jenkins into problems. I am saying that this movie, whether you're leftist or whether you're rightist, right wing, right winger, this movie should strike a balance where you start to identify with certain things that this protagonist is going through. Because Patty Jenkins definitely is going to carry it through Wonder Woman's eyes. She can capture the essence of Wonder Woman. I already know right wingers are going to love this movie because it's got a lot of action. And right wingers love their guns. They love action. They love violence. So I know right wingers are on this movie already. Left wingers now, they're going to be on this movie for a different reason. They're going to be on this movie because of the, the nature of Wonder Woman, how she really is, what she really is aspiring to, what are, her, what are her goals, 
why she's doing what she's doing. They're going to look at that and they're going to say, oh, okay, I can align with this. Because if you're going to do comics, if you're going to do movies, if you're going to do a movie in Hollywood, you've got to have a purpose for what you do. You should be able to reflect the society you're in, yes. But you should also show the society we have a potential to change. We don't, we're don't. we evolving as a society. We have a potential to change. And if, if, if Patty Jenkins can get the pure essence of what this character is supposed to be about, which is love, and um, she's also about hope, and she's, well, not so much hope. She's about love, courage, um, wisdom, and what's the other one? I forgot. All right. And power. Right. There you go. Right. And again, if you go into Greek mythology on the goddess Diana, whether you look at the Ephesians, whether you look at whatever, I've gone through this a hundred million times. Whether you go through Ashtar, which is a Persian, Mesopotamian god, whatever you want to call them, these all these gods, common G-O-D-S, are based off of actual people that existed. And people took the stories and they blew it out of proportion and they started worshipping these things when they should have just learned from the attributes and moved on, right? So at the end of the day, when you look at these characters, do understand that the modern comics are just, it, it's nothing new here. This is the same story. It's a story that was told all the way back into Egypt. It was a story told all the way back in Sumeria. The early, the early people, the early descendants of Japheth, the early descendants of uh, what's, what's his name? Ham and, and what's the other guy? Seth, all right? The Sethians. All of them knew this story, okay? When Nimrod was building his uh, tower into heaven, when everybody had started assembling down that side, you got to understand this story was around, okay? We know about Ashtar, right? And we know Ashtar was since... Ashtar was one of the sons of... I can't remember who... If it was Japheth or Ham or one of them. But Ashtar was one of those guys, right? And then they built a whole city. And then they had these deities that started to be made towards one of these people. You see, when you have somebody who is someone who probably was very, very good. People try to honor them. And then they lose sight of God. And then they start worshipping them when they die. So let's say, so for instance, somebody was a really nice person. We got like busts of different people. We got... Bust of Columbus. We got bust over there in our arima of some 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 Ariman chief, right? Who was a Native American. We got bust of Eric Williams and so on. Now, as time goes further and further away, we think of these people as cleaner and purer than they really were in their time. Sometimes people were controversial figures. They suddenly started to become these huge, immense, godlike figures. And this is what happened. With all of these characters we're talking about, Ashtar, Nimrod, all of these guys, right? As time passed, people started to worship these things. And this is what happens all the time. And it's, it's because when you have somebody who's mighty and has done great things, people honor them. Because worship means to honor. And then all of a sudden, the honor gets out of proportion. And we start to honor these people like if they were gods from another world or something. And like they could have done no wrong. And then all of a sudden... People back in the day, they started offering sacrifices. And get what the sacrifices they're offering. They're offering little children. They're killing them. And they're offering them to these things. So this is the ridiculousness of what happened. And this is what happens over time. It's not that these civilizations didn't know God. Oh, all of them did. All of them came from Noah. So they all knew God. But then they veered away, as Romans 1 said, and they went their own way and they decided to worship men and worship things and worship creations. They went off on a tangent. And that's when you get way too comfortable in this life. You get so comfortable that you start to veer off on a tangent. And then all of a sudden, you, certain things take up more of your attention than others. All right? So I hope that this was educational to you guys. Looking forward to this movie, obviously. But on that note, I hope you guys enjoyed my video. Don't forget, you can donate to my channel. To donate to my channel, all you have to do is, again, message me, and I will give you the details. Because as I said before, online, I don't have any way of getting paid online. So you have to message me, and then I will show you how you can actually donate to my channel. And share these videos. I know you guys see it. I know a lot of other channels watch my videos. And I'm happy about that. You guys have a great one.